In this video, I'm going to share with you how Caleb Yun, a professional road cyclist with UCI World Tour team Lotto Sedal and arguably the best sprinter in the entire world, a man that won three stages of the Tour de France in 2019 and a man that tore my legs off in the local Noosa Bunch Ride in 2020, just a few days ago now. You see, it's the professional off-season as we speak, so many of the Aussie pro cyclists are back in town, and Caleb is in Noosa, in my local hometown, staying with his family as we speak. In addition to showing you this leg-tearing attack, I will also share some bunch riding tips and tactics in this video and explain what happened to Caleb's bike, which pretty much made it a certainty that he would rip the bunch to shreds going up the Coolum Hills. Just note that in this video, I will skip forward, pause, and or slow down the footage from time to time just to ensure we can make the most of our time together here. And hey, if you've just landed on this channel, a reason to support or subscribe to the channel in 2020 if you already haven't. The channel's gonna have a new format from February onwards, which will be Wednesdays, a road cycling training tip video from me a road cycling coach, and on Fridays, when I say Wednesday and Friday here, we're talking Aussie time, we'll have a vlog-style video, which is all about mixing bike racing with a busy family lifestyle. So if all that sounds up your alley, please consider supporting the channel by subscribing below. Now, before we get back into this video, I just wanted to take a small amount of time to express some incredible misfortune that is occurring in Australia at the moment, notably the severe bushfires that are occurring across the country. To date, many have lost their lives or homes and families have been devastated by what has occurred. Many people are in distress and my heart goes out to everyone involved. I've left a donation link below for anyone that would like to get behind a disaster appeal. The Nichols family have just donated $100 ourselves, but please remember, particularly to all those Aussies out there, that these communities don't only need our help now, but in the years to come. Help can be as simple as visiting an affected area on holidays, simply to help inject much needed funds into local economies over the years. So this bunch ride is roughly 55 kilometers all up. It's a Saturday bunch ride, but the smash fest component is just under 15 kilometers or nine miles for all my US friends. So essentially where I have started the GoPro from today is where this bunch ride ramps up. If you want the full lowdown on this bunch ride, I've made another video about it, which I'll link to below. This bunch ride was much bigger today than it usually is because of the holiday period. Typically, you'd see about 10 to 20 riders on this bunch, but this day, there would have been somewhere around about 50, I reckon, but most of them were behind my wheel. So I really do need to invest into a rear GoPro in 2020, so stay tuned for that. As you can see though, I've gone straight to the front here. Reason being, it's a big bunch today, a lot of unfamiliar riders, so for safety reasons, I don't wanna be anywhere near the back. In doing so though, I find myself at the front. And unexpectedly, given the volume of riders here today, I get left hung out to dry for quite a while here. In fact, let's play some elevator music and see just how long I get left out here for. While we're watching me dry roast at the front of the bunch here, I'm gonna pull up my zones and power numbers to make a little point. You see, typically at the start of most bunch rides, people get excited. Quite often you'll see monster efforts by a certain few within the first five to 10 minutes. And in many cases, you never see those riders again. So I'm making a concerted effort not to go too hard here, lingering in my bottom end, the mid-range zone six. So I've still got some juice left in the tank for further efforts in this bunch ride today. You see, if I was pushing 100 to 200 more watts here for the total of this effort I'm currently doing, I would have been toast for the remainder of the ride. So being smart about your efforts in the bunch, particularly up front, will ensure you can go harder for longer as opposed to being a one-hit wonder. So it was roughly two minutes after I got the bunch going here. My good North Coast racing mates in the white come to the rescue, although I was kind of thinking, what bloody took you so long, lads? As the chain of riders finally commences, you'll see two pro cyclists, actually. Freddie Ovey, I think that's how you say his name, I hope, from the Israel Cycling Academy, and, of course, 
Caleb. Now, as you can see, there's quite a big conga line in today's bunch with many getting involved between here and where the leg tearing occurred. Why not, I'd say? It's one of the great things about road cycling. How many other sports in the world can you go out and have a go with a professional alongside you? So we're going to skip forward slightly here to a set of traffic lights. It was at this stopping point where I must admit that I butted in to get behind the great Caleb Yoon. While I was slightly aggressive about getting into this pole position, for those local riders who were directly exposed to this and now think I'm a giant knob, please know that I was purely doing this for YouTube viewing pleasure as we lead into the leg ripping area. Which is brought to you by this 1950s chainsaw. Stanley here, who is wearing a mask given the level of debris he will be exposed to today, will be tearing this bunch of lugs to pieces thanks to a brand new chainsaw that is supercharged by something deep inside called Ewan. In fact, Stanley only needs to run Ewan at just under 60% before logs will start snapping into pieces and the entire bunch will be ripped to shreds. Nice one, Stanley. So I'm on Caleb's wheel here, and I wanted to point something out for you here. And what I found out post-ride is that Caleb's DI2 was flat. Apparently, he realized as soon as he stepped out in the morning. So he rode the entire bunch in the 54-16. So as Caleb begins this leg-tearing attack, I just wanted to point out that this climb is only an average of 2% gradient according to Strava, but it does have some nasty pinches at around 8 to 10%. And because it flattens out and then rises again, it's a tricky one to get a rhythm for what is just under a three-minute effort. Note here also that I've done a turn into the bottom of the hill, so I'm carrying slightly lactate-induced legs into a tearing attack. So let's just watch this now unfold. So not a ridiculous volume of power up that first pinch, but definitely going deep into the neuromuscular system, which is a point I want to isolate after we get to the end of the bunch here. So let's watch round two unfold. So I've pulled over really quickly here. Why is that? Many in this position in a bunch ride would typically hang on to the wheel until they drop for way too long a period. See, the problem with that is by the time they have dropped the wheel, they're normally one, two, maybe even three bike lengths back, and the rider behind them has to make up two to three, maybe even four bike lengths to get back onto the wheel. So essentially, it's inconsiderate to the rider behind you and the others who have to follow. So what you're better off doing is what I'm showing you here. Right now, I am starting to cook. I'm just under 800 watts for the second mini attack. My legs are full of lactate and Caleb is still out of the saddle punching it. So my chances of staying on the wheel here are limited. And as a result, I make a very quick call, pull over real quick, flick the elbow and let the rider behind go through. And that rider, which you'll see is Freddie from the Israel Cycling Academy, only has one to 1.5 bike lengths to make up. And just know, I'm not dropping myself here. The plan is to have a slight breather and get back onto the back of the bunch. So what I didn't know was that Caleb would sit up shortly after I pulled off. So potentially, I would have been okay if I hung onto the wheel. Although, you are about to see another punch out of the saddle. So probably not. As I look behind me here, I saw some riders coming. What I didn't realize though is there were only two remaining of a starting bunch of about 50 riders. And what I have since learned after the ride is that there was also a split just after the traffic light stop. So what I've done here is I've pulled over to the side, haven't really rested, and now I am in no man's land. Potentially, what I should have done when I pulled off is spent a few moments in a lower gear, giving myself a proper rest, and then sprinted back onto the group. Instead, what you're seeing here is me dangle for a while, and then the light bulb moment to put some pressure down and get back onto the wheel. What's also a bit disappointing here is that I am dangling out on the road as opposed to being over in the bike lane, which is a demonstration of how fatigue can make you ride and also awareness we all need to have in these pressure cooker situations on the road. 
So the remnants of the bunch are back together. We roll through the Coulomb area before putting the pressure back down. Now, what I personally found interesting during this section is normally I can recover well through Coulomb and get back involved in the turns pretty quickly. However, on this occasion, I was done. I rolled a couple of times, but I could feel the legs were no good. Now, many of you out there will conclude that it was Caleb's leg tearing episode which caused this level of fatigue. But really, looking at the numbers, Caleb was probably only going about 60% and I wasn't pushing out massive watts. So why was I so cooked here, I pondered. Aha, I did figure it out reflecting later that day. About two months ago, I transitioned my training from being criterium fit, not that I was doing a ton of criteriums, but that's kind of like the fitness I typically like to maintain. I transitioned to getting prepared to tackle a 265-kilometer bike race being the Melbourne to Warrnambool. As a result of this style of training, I simply have neglected to train my sprint or my neuromuscular system, mainly because I simply haven't had the opportunity to blend it into what has been some major endurance rides. That has been the predominant focus for me in recent times. However, normally I would head to the local track and do some sprint efforts after a high intensity workout, working the neuromuscular system or my sprint, which ultimately teaches you to be able to go deep multiple times in a row. So this was a little wake up call for me actually. It's time for me to bring the sprinting back into training. And quickly on training, as we now watch a very unusual finish to this bunch ride, I think everyone was a bit cooked, including myself, and not sure where Caleb had gone either. I have a free video training below for road cyclists looking to take their cycling performance to the next level, and I've actually reopened an online course that I have welcoming 10 students into up-level road cycling course for January over the next week. Links below. Just know this was a big day out for me. Actually, I rode 170 kilometers all up in preparation for the Melbourne to Warrnambool. And let me tell you, I enjoyed a couple of quiet ones later that evening. You can get it riding. I'll catch everyone in the next video. You can get it sliding. You can feel it coming on about four. A hard-earned thirst needs a big cold beer. And the best cold beer is Vic, Vic Bitter. You can get it in a hole, or up a pole. You can get it doing nothing at all. A hard-earned thirst 